Hey, welcome to Our City Church. Uh, if we haven't gotten the chance to meet yet, my name is Pastor Chris, and I'm the lead pastor here. And I am so glad. If this is your first time, or maybe you're just coming back for a second or third time, welcome. Welcome to our community. Uh, we are a, a, a community that loves God and loves you. And we want you to know that no matter where you're at on the faith spectrum, whatever your beliefs are, you're welcome here. You don't have to believe like us to belong here. Uh, I was not always a believer in Jesus. I didn't always believe what I believe today. And if it wasn't for people who let me figure it out along the way, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at. And I want you to know that this church was created for people who would like to learn more about what faith or spirituality is and, uh, and to hear our version of it. And so today we're going to talk and finish our collection of topics on the home. And if you haven't been here and, and this is your first time, you know, we've been talking about what does it mean for our homes to be built in a way that are enjoyable, are rewarding, are life-giving, uh, are sustaining, uh, can go through the storms of life, uh, can be joy-filled, deal with conflict, all of those things. And today we're going to hone in and talk through how can our homes, how could we as members of our homes, either the home you have now or the home you want someday, how can you be a person that knows how to grow in the midst of difficult seasons. I, I want to teach you today how to grow no matter what, like no matter what's going on, learn how to grow. Because often what we do is we just think, man, I just got to survive. And I want you to be able to do that. But I want you to do more than just survive and hang on and make it through. I want you to learn what are the things that can actually still help you grow. Because if you're a parent, you ever had a kid, or if you're a person that's ever been on a losing team in Little League or softball or soccer or whatever, and it's like when you went in, you thought, you know, you hadn't played yet. You thought, man, our teams could be good. We've got a couple good players. And then before you know it, man, you're just like losing games and losing games and losing games. And you would almost think like it's all for naught. But as a parent, you know, or your parents, what they knew that now many of you have learned is some of the most difficult things that happen in our lives. Some of the most hard like difficult, heartbreaking type moments are the ones that actually do help us grow the most. But it's almost accidental for so many of us. And I don't want that to be the case for you. I want your home, the relationships in your home, your future home, I don't want them to accidentally get stronger. I want them to intentionally get stronger, to on purpose be able to coalesce, strengthen, have resolve. And today I wanna show you what exactly that looks like. Uh, and so what I've done is I've taken a bunch of the different messages messages over the last many, many, many years that we've preached here and I've preached here and we've pulled a bunch of different ideas from those and kind of put them together and say, here's what we believe are the best ways that the Bible teaches us to grow when it's hard, to grow when it's difficult, to not just, man, barely make it, but to say, I didn't just barely make it. I learned how to intentionally grow when it's hard. And of course, right now, man, it is hard. It's hard. It's been difficult. All of us have been locked up, right? And it's been very difficult for us to feel um, normal, alive, excited. Um, many of you are stressing out at school. It's difficult to be a parent, a principal, a, a wife, a husband, and also be a teacher. A lot of us are having to do online stuff. We're at home so much more. And the normal things that usually bring us uh, the joy we need aren't there. This is a tough season. I want you not to just be able to survive the next part of 2020. As we're in September and we're moving into October, November, December, I want the next four months for you to be able to say, I intentionally was able to grow. And I want to talk about what that looks like today because things that happen are seasonal. Like tough seasons don't last forever, but great seasons don't last forever. Um, and, and when you have a difficult season, Sometimes they're expected, sometimes they're unexpected, and, um, and, and you know this, right? Like, you know if there, there are kids in the house that you're going to eventually face an empty nest. Some of you are going through that now. Um, you know that other seasons come out of nowhere. You never saw it coming, right? You know when you are pregnant, you're going to go into, if you've had a child before or what you've learned, like, it's going to be hard. There's going to be difficult seasons, and I want to go around a bunch of different scripture verses today and share with you the perspective overall of the Bible. Literally, I want to walk through like from Genesis all the way to the New Testament into the writings of Paul and show you how the Bible has over thousands of years given us wisdom and principles that I hope you will be able to apply to your life. Genesis 8, 22 says it this way, as long as the earth endures, nothing will put a stop to planting and to harvesting, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. God established seasons, okay? And also not just seasons for the earth, but seasons for our lives, 
And they are relational seasons, emotional seasons, spiritual seasons. Um, life's seasonal shifts can be disorienting, and they can also be discouraging. Um, you, your career could stall. You could end up having more debt than you anticipated. Your car can break down. Your, your child's car can break down. Your um, grief can all of a sudden just be attacked because of the loss of someone that you love. There's so many different ways that life can come and crash down on you and you can't control that. When it happens, how long it's going to stay. And we do have to learn how to walk through them. And one of the things we often ask is like, why is this happening? I don't understand. What's the purpose of this? And we rarely understand why at the beginning of the difficulty. We rarely understand why in the moment it's unraveling. But as we look back, many of you, if you looked back at the, some of the harder things you've gone through, you would say, I gained perspective. I gained wisdom. I gained insight. I gained strength. I gained experience to be able to deal with things that are more difficult than I knew how to do before that, but nobody ever knew it going in or would choose that to be the teaching lesson of how you learn those things. And yet we're glad we have them. And so I want you to be able to lean in and see this today. Now, there are some things that will happen that we will never understand. The Bible teaches us in Ecclesiastes, Saul, I'm sorry, um, Solomon, King Solomon wrote this. He does everything just right and on time. Um, he's not talking about husbands there. He's talking about God. Uh, but listen, he continues, but people can never completely understand what he is doing. And we don't like that, do we? We don't like that. It doesn't seem fair. And today we live in an offended culture, right? Everyone is offended, easily offended. And when you're offended, now you have a good reason to like pump out that social media post about your offense and how that is off-putting to you. And I've done it, you've done it. I, I think we overdo it. Um, and, and so it's almost like offensive, like crazy. And what I think that we have to do is recognize that just because everybody's offended about something, we should learn how to understand, look, we're never gonna completely understand why these things are happening. We're so quick to demand respect and fairness, and yet then we lash out at anything at all that is any slight or anything we disagree with. And, and it's, 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 it's obviously hypocritical. It's like, I, I, I want there to be understanding the things I do wrong, but if you do something wrong, I'm all over you for that. Uh, I, I think that we have to learn how to express things differently. And, um, and it's like road rage, on, <laughs> road rage on social media, right? Just like these bursts of crazy. And I want to say this to you and write this down in the chat, type this in. This is a real key idea today is if you're easily offended, then you'll be easily defeated. Write that in there. If you're easily offended, you'll be easily defeated. You will be easily taken down, taken out of whatever it is that God's purpose or plan is for your life, of the things that you've been working on. If you get easily offended, you lose your bearings, you lose sight of what really matters, you lose your perspective, and all of a sudden you start fighting these little battles about the little things that are offending you. And I want us to allow um, God's ideas to dictate our response. And if we allow, other people's words, other people's actions to dictate how we feel and respond. We're giving the power of how we're going to have our life feel and be each day to other people and letting them decide our daily life. And I don't want us to spend our life trying to you know, undo responses that we've had. Uh, I don't want us to have to spend our life jumping to wrong conclusions and then, oh, you know, I overreacted. Um, when we do that, we end up stressed, tensed, mad. We fragilely, like, or, or we, relationships are fragile and they're impacted and hurt and broken. It's just a bad way to live. And there are some people uh, that have a difficult season and they decide that God wasn't there and they just say, look, I'm not going to follow God. You know, God wasn't there. I had a difficult season. They're angry and for good reason. Um, in many cases, abuse, uh, loss of life or a major failure in life, a uh, discouraging season. It's legit. It's, it's real pain. It's hard. And then that gets directed at God. But I want you to know that life's seasonal shifts can also be enriching though, and they can be rewarding. And God can bring good to every season that has been difficult. He can bring good to lonely seasons. He can bring good to sad seasons. He can bring good to seasons of failure or grief or loss or hurt, all of them. He can bring good to those if he's given the opportunity for that. Romans 8, 28 says, we are confident that God is able to orchestrate everything to work towards something good. 
and beautiful when we love him and accept his invitation to live according to his plan. What a great promise that we can hold on to God's goodness in the midst of difficulty, that he will work all things. It doesn't say that all things will be good. It just says he will orchestrate them for good for our good. That's a promise you can hang on to, that even when the world does evil or hurt or broken or selfish things that are bad to us, or things that just happen naturally in our fallen world, where, where things, accidents, or, or untimely deaths, or illnesses, or sicknesses, and those things happen, it doesn't mean that those things are good. It just means God will work it for our good. God does not plan my problems. To be honest, I'm awesome at creating my own problems. I don't really need anyone's help. But God is not the author of evil, and he's not the author of pain, but he can bring purpose to every single season. And no matter how dark, shameful, bad, or guilty that, that it ever gets for you or bitter, God makes good of it. And the, and the verse doesn't say, again, that like it's going to be awesome. When your car, like l- engine blows up, you know, it's not like you're like, hey, praise the Lord, so happy about that. You're not stoked on a flat tire. You're not stoked on a fender bender. Like none of these things are exciting, but when we're in the middle of it, we can still trust. Look, I don't know how I'm going to fix this. I don't know how I'm going to replace this thing. I don't know what that looks like right now, but I do trust And I choose to trust, which is a choice. Trust is a choice. You do it. It's not some um, emotion you chase down or you just have it bubbling out of you. Trust is a choice. Type that in. Trust is a choice. It's something you choose to do when you sometimes don't want to do it. And you say, God, I put my trust in you. Meaning I put it in you. I don't just like, well, I don't feel it. So I'm not, I'm just not going to do it. No, don't let your emotions be in charge. Let your faith be in charge and put your trust in him, in his goodness in that he will bring things to your good. It it doesn't mean that it will always feel that way. It won't be easy to do. Galatians has something else to say about that. In Galatians 6, 9, Paul wrote this. So let's not get tired of doing what is good, but at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Meaning, I will sow in one season and I will reap in another. You plant in the spring, but you harvest in the fall, and that's how it works. But in our, gotta have it now, I want it immediately, like now, 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 society, we want to plant it in the morning and harvest it in the afternoon. And that's not how life works. That's not what scripture teaches us life is going to be like. And the way that I respond to a season that's taking longer than a day uh, that I'm facing has to do with how I will reap it in the future, the way I manage it when it's planting season. I guess a question that might be good for you right now is, uh, what path are you on in this season? Uh, How can God make the most of this season for you and grow you in the middle of it? And I think there's four growth choices I want you to leave today's message with. And I want you to be able to identify these four different ways that you can begin to incorporate into your life in difficult seasons, which will help you make it. The first one, and type this up, write this down, is to trust God's love and intentions for you to trust God's love and intentions for you. This is a foundational truth to growing through a difficult season. You gotta begin with trust and you have to choose trust. Even when you don't get how things are going or understand them, we choose trust. When it's long, when it's slow, when it's difficult, you choose to trust. You trust in him and in his love and you, 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 you hold on to the fact that like God loves me. Like he loves me, he really loves you. And because he really loves you, you can know he's gonna bring me through this. He's he's going to see me through this. It is not easy, but this isn't how it ends. And there are some things that we only learn through experience, right? Like school of hard knocks is a legit school. We, we, many of us have a doctor's degree. Um, some of you feel like, you know, you just, you're like, dude, I literally have multiple doctorates of the school of hard knocks. Deuteronomy said it this way. Remember today what you have learned about the Lord through your experiences with him. Meaning like we will learn how God operates when we involve him and trust him and walk with him through our lives. And we learn to trust him and through trusting him, we are able to experience things and face them differently next time. Uh, It's not always in what you read about him or what you've heard about him, 
Many of you have people around you who have experiences with God, and we draw strength from that, but I want you not to just have people you know that have experiences with God. I want you to have an experience with God. I want you to learn what it's like to see him come through, but to see him come through, you've got to give him a chance by trusting him when you don't know how it's going to work out, and then when he does come through, you have a newfound faith. You have a strength. You have an experience that you can rely on knowing he came through for you. What does God want me to learn? I think he wants you to learn lots of things, but there's one thing he wants us to learn in the middle of those types of seasons. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says this, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. Here's what happened. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead, which is like an afterthought. Like we rely on God for these difficulties because after all, he raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us us. Listen, you're going to face difficult experiences in your life, and if, if, you, if you allow it, one of the things you'll draw from it is to be able to trust God. There are times in your life when all you have left is God, and that's all you've got, and you'll learn that he's all you'll need. He will see you through whatever it is you're facing. This happens when we trust God's love and his intentions for us. The second thing is to prioritize your primary relationships. Our Western emphasis on independence or, or, or you know, just me and mine and what I got to do, if it's, up, if it's to be, it's up to me, really creates more loneliness for us than I think a lot of us understand. The problem of this fight between independence and interdependence, especially if you're married, interdependence is crucial to your relationships, okay? Uh, in, a, in, a, in a book, Wired for Love by Stan Tatkin, He suggests couples create an environment that guarantees safety. It's called the couple bubble, okay? And the idea is that we're in this together and that we are interdependent, that I can't just get strong on my own. I can't get through a challenge on my own. I can't just be confident on my own. I can't just be secure on my own, that I need and require interdependence to make use of my partner um, to be able to get through that stuff together. He said, we need to make these guarantees to one another. Here they are. I will never leave you. Number two, I will never frighten you purposely. Um, for some of you, I know that you do that accidentally when you drive them, but like, this is like, I will never intentionally frighten you to, to intimidate you or, or, or to try to get over on you. Uh, when you're in distress, I'll relieve you even if I'm the one causing the distress. So that means if you begin to recognize that you're causing someone else distress, you're supposed to stop your point of view, stop your, whatever you're trying to get them to understand. It no longer matters what you're trying to get them to understand because they're not able to understand it there in fight or flight. So the most important thing then is how can I get you out of distress? How can I relieve these fear factors that you're experiencing right now and calm you down so we can continue the discussion, even if it's a disagreement, that the most important thing isn't being right about your point. The most important thing is getting your partner right emotionally in that moment so you can continue to have the talk. The last one is our relationship is more important than my need to be right. Some of you need to type that in. My relationship is more important than my need to be right. And if some of us were honest, man, it's like, dude, I don't know about you, but I know for me, sometimes there's nothing more important than my need to be right. Because I love my ideas when they're right, right? Like, and some of you, like, I don't know, if I wasn't a pastor, I guess maybe I'll, I don't know what I would be, but I would definitely have loved to try to be a lawyer because I would love the idea of defending truth and fighting for truth, especially if there was injustice. Man, I would love to go battle for that. But the reality is, is sometimes that that human part or that gift that God gave me can, can get out of bounds and just be overemphasized in me. And, and I have to learn and you have to learn and we have to learn how can we make sure, as he says, that the relationship is more important than being right about whatever it is that happened or your point of view of who said what and she said what. The idea of interdependence promotes confidence. The ability to say, I am safe, I am loved, is super important in our relationships, especially in our marriages. And our focus on self puts happiness on hold because we wait for problems to get solved. We get ready to be happy, but it doesn't happen. And when this kid is out of diapers, 
When the job comes, when they get it together, when we have kids, when the kids move out, then I'll be happy. And you keep waiting. We keep waiting for this magical season that you'll be happy when this newfound euphoric moment of life happens. The reality is, is that the Bible encourages us, regardless of the season we're in, that we can be thankful and joyful. And if you keep waiting for this perfect season, you're never going to do it because it comes from within. It comes from you having faith to say, I, I want to be this way. First uh, Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. We can only do that when we make the choice to trust God's love and his intentions. And even when I don't, quote, get it, or I don't feel it, I'm still going to trust. I can go all in with God. This pivotal concept of, in life is that time is life and life is short. So I want to make sure that I'm using the limited amount of time I've got, the limited amount to say, how could I trust him and how could I prioritize my primary relationships in this? In James 4, verse 14, it says, how do you know what will happen tomorrow? What, after all, is your life? It's like a puff of smoke. It's visible for a little while and then it's disappearing into thin air. I mean, that helps us have perspective on, look, this thing's going to go. Your life is quick. And, and, and one lie I think we think in difficult seasons is, is I got time. I'll get to my priorities later. I'll learn to trust God later. I'll learn to like handle the way I deal with this conflict later. And I think that what happens is we do what we need to do and we do what we think is most important because we think we have time. It's like, oh, I got time. I'll get to that. And you're going to have to make tough choices in those seasons about what's really important in this particular difficulty. And I think that until we really recognize what it is that is most important to trust God's love, his intentions, and to make use of our primary relationships, then, then we're just like tossed by the emotional days that we have. Whatever's going on, whatever, whatever other people treat us like, that becomes the, the thing that we feel. And reality is, uh, it takes practice to do this kind of stuff. It's not easy to do. To be interdependent is hard, especially if you've been hurt or, or, or disappointed or let down by people you love. Then you're like, skip that. I'm not going to be dependent on you to be secure. I'm going to be secure in me. But you can't be secure in it of yourself, on yourself. You need it to be something that you feel within a healthy, committed relationship, specifically in marriage. Uh, communicate, number three, communicate clearly and often. Some of you um, it's whenever we communicate, it's a fight. It turns into a struggle. What we need to do is learn to communicate more. Okay. Not less. You have to learn how, and you have, you can only do it by doing it. Like you have to learn to do it and you just get into it. And the problem is that your spouse and the primary relationship in your life, that there's this other language that they speak. Okay. We have a first language called self-protection. We tend to hear and speak through hurt protecting our heart. So everything I'm hearing is protecting me, making sure I don't get hurt. That's my primary language, okay? But they speak a totally different language. Do you know the words and the phrases that trigger uh, fear or anger in your spouse? Maybe you do and uh, maybe you don't. Maybe you do and you use them because you know you can get off the hook for what you've done wrong if you get them to blow up. So you know you just start counterattacking like whatever you're feeling wrong about because you have a hard time admitting when you're wrong maybe. So when you start feeling wrong, you're like, uh-oh, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And instead of learning how to be healthy and communicate, look, I think you're right and I do see what you're saying and I, and I could see how that would be hurtful or that would cause you to feel like super upset or triggered or just disoriented emotionally and I don't want that. It's more important to make you feel okay and to repair and to calm you than to be right about whatever I thought I was saying. Clearly that came across wrong and I'm sorry. We don't learn to do that, and so we actually learn how uh, I don't want to be wrong, so the only way to get out of being wrong is to make you be more wrong by kind of poking at you and the things you don't handle so well, and then you blow up, and now it's like, well, geez, you've blown up so bad. How could you possibly say anything to me anymore about what I did? And that's a, 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 it's a tactic that many people don't even know they do, but they, it's like a built-in tactic that we learned often in our childhood, and we play it out in our primary relationships, but this is a problem way to deal. We have to learn how to speak the language so that we can say to them the things they need to hear to calm them. When we use phrases like, you're just like your mom, you're just like your dad, you always, you never, you know, like you don't, you don't, there's no, there's no, there's always, you always, there's no, like this kind of language is nothing but triggering, condemning, putting down. 
And after we say, I do, you say, I choose you. And then unknowingly, we also say, I choose who you're going to become, and we're going to become more interdependent. Often what we think is, well, I said, I do to who you were, but who they were isn't who they're going to be. They're going to change over life. They're going to change over time. Your commitment isn't, well, as long as you stay exactly like that, then I'll stay committed to you. But if you change and you adapt or you shift or you, 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 well, I don't know, all bets are off. And I, I believe that we have to say, no, I want to be committed to you and to be interdependent. And if you don't make that choice, you will go separately because I'm going to be my own person. And this idea of independence will breed loneliness because you will never find anyone who will magically stay constantly exactly like fit for you. They're gonna change, you're gonna change, things you change about and things that you're different of are gonna disappoint them. So if all the reasons you change disappointed someone else and they go, well, I'm out. I just want, I don't, I, I don't wanna have to rely on the way you're being different. I, 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 I want me, I'm gonna go deal for me, I'm gonna go do for me. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're gonna be lonely because there's no such thing as finding anyone who perfectly never changes exactly to the tune that you need it to or changes exactly to the tune you need it to. It's like, it's, imat- it's a matter of time before that will lead to loneliness. Uh, does it mean that you don't get to be your own person? No. Does it mean that you're lost in another person's life? No. What it means is when we risk interdependence, we actually become more of who we're made to be. And this takes clear and regular communication. And that's how you learn a language, repetition, doing it over and over and over again until you get good at it. And some of you are going to suck at it. Some of you already suck at it. And you're just going to start trying and it's going to be awful and worse. And you're just like, dude, I don't even want to try. Let's just go back to our corners and stick with what we've done, even if we both know we don't like it. The risk to become interdependent is so important. You will figure it out. Some of you, it may be so volatile at this point to learn to do these things. You're going to need to get a third party. And there's no like shame in that. We say it all the time. Look, there is no shame in needing help and getting it. There is shame in knowing you need help and not getting it because that is prideful. It is arrogant and it's coward. You avoid what is difficult because you don't want to deal. And that isn't strong. That's weak. We want us to have a strong church that is strong enough and humble enough to say, I think I need some help. I think this relationship needs some help. We should go talk to somebody who could kind of help us and share with us perspectives that we're not hearing from each other. And I think that's healthy. In Proverbs 20 verse five, it says, knowing what is right is like deep water in the heart. A wise person draws from the well within. We were created to love and hope deeply, and that's part of our DNA, but our hearts through painful experiences become so calloused and they become so afraid that we don't want to risk feeling anything like that because it hurts, and so we hide, and we can't even remember what's in there. And if we're going to get good at communication with the people in our lives, we've got to begin by learning how to communicate with our Heavenly Father because that happens when we step back from the chaos, we step back from the busyness, and we learn to talk, and we also learn to listen to him, because otherwise, we just go from stress to stress to stress to stress, and you don't get good at listening. You don't get good at resting. You don't get good at hearing him when we do that, and I believe that it's vital for us, and I know, look, some of us have experienced so much pain that there's so much trauma and drama and we're always stressed. We get ulcers. It causes relationship breakdown and anger. And we need to come to the place of peace. Learning to listen to God helps us learn to listen to other people as well. The last one is start today. And that's the fourth one. Start today. Make a choice to grow today. Decide today. I need to grow in these areas. I'm not going to just, oh, woohoo, listen to the message. Cool, good points, yay, oh, great message, see you next week. No, like decide that you're going to set aside time to look at some of this stuff and be honest with yourself. Make a choice that you'll do that today. One of the things that can help you grow is serving the people in your life. What good can you do in this season right now? Not waiting. Don't say, well, I'll do much better later. Like, do it right now. Help someone face their season. Do it together. In Proverbs verse 3, it says this, whenever you're able, do good to people who need help. 
Who could you help through a tough season, serve someone else's season, encourage somebody else's season? We get so myopic, we get so focused on our own pain that sometimes we don't know how to help others. But it's helpful for you to gain perspective on on what you are going through and maybe what you're not going through. Uh, When it's overwhelming, sometimes it's good to hear what someone else is carrying. You're like, wow, like mine is painful, Yours is, I, I'm, I'm actually now happy that my pain is as much as it is because yours is worse, you know? And it is, it's helpful to kind of get around people and serve them when they're carrying a heavier burden than you might be. Uh, I, I want you to take a moment and write it down. And if you're in the chat live, go ahead and write it down even um, in the chat or, or type or write it into your notes. Um, write this down, this week I will, and fill in the blank. Like what one of those things you heard me say, will you say this week, I'm going to do this. Um, and, and, and I want you to know that like, I'm, I'm praying for you to make a choice today, a choice to trust him and his good intentions and his love, a choice to make better use of your primary relationship and not be so independent on my own, but interdependent, trusting this person to soothe and repair you when you're in distress and to not try to be so right that the relationship is so wrong that you learn to make the relationship right and you don't have to always be so right. This is what you can begin to do. And I wanna review again, the things that are so important, they're gonna come up on the screen, is to trust God's love and intentions for you, to prioritize your primary relationships, uh, to communicate clearly and often, and to remember that they are listening from a lens and uh, of ears of a language that says, I don't wanna be hurt. Sometimes what you're watching someone do isn't anything other than fear of being hurt by your words. And if you can learn to see that and go, oh, I think um, the way I'm saying this is hurtful or hard for you, I want to say it different. Instead of, I'm not saying it wrong, you're hearing it wrong. Like, whoa, you might be saying it perfect, but if they're hearing it harsh, you've got to find another way because it's all about communicating, making sure you can land your words. This is vital. And maybe some of you need to build trust in your marriage. I want to speak specifically to married people today. Um, Or you need to prioritize it, or you need to work on your communication. Or maybe you need to build some romance, um, or remember to have fun and laugh. You're just always serious because you guys fight all the time. You don't know how to, like, laugh. You almost feel like you can't laugh because you're in a fight too much. And my pastor told me one time, dude, laughing will get you out of fights, and so will sex. And Brent and I... Uh, we do both to try to get out of our fights. And it's important that you learn how to make use of the things that will bring you out. It doesn't mean you avoid the conversations. It doesn't mean you don't talk about it. It means that you're committed to the relationship more than you are to being right. Don't be so prideful and arrogant and stubborn about what you want to make sure you were right about because now you're being right about you and wrong about your relationship. And that is low functioning relationship skills. I want you to have high functioning relationship skills. The Bible wants you to have high functioning relationship skills. So here's what we're gonna do. If you're single and you don't wanna be, we've got something for you. If you're married and you wanna improve your relationship, we've got something fun and able for you. Um, We have made this resource free. It isn't free, but there's a bunch of people in our church that give to kingdom builders and we use kingdom builders to help help our church grow to help people in the kingdom of God who need it. And so if you're in a position where it's like, dude, our relationship needs help. It's hurting. It's harsh. It's in a lull or it just needs a change. It needs some pep. We want to offer you this free resource called Date Box. In order to get it, I want you to text, get your phone out right now, um, and text the number 949-755-7606. 949-755-7606, and just text the phrase Date Box. And it's going to come in. We've sponsored that through Kingdom Builders for those of you watching wherever you are. If you're a part of our church, or you just watch this link, or you're in South Africa or Australia, wherever you are, it doesn't matter, because I know we got people in Australia to you, you know who you are. I love you guys. Um, we are wanting you to make use of this date box. It's going to be really helpful for you. Um, one last verse I want to share with you. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Don't wait for it to get tied up in a bow and be a perfect season to grow. Start growing now, living in the season you're in now, not waiting for some one day when the kids are grown, not in diapers, when you got making more money, when you live on your own, when whatever it is that you're telling yourself is the perfect conditions for you to become this new person. Don't wait. 
Don't do that. The Bible says, no, now, today's the day. Like, get after it now. Help other people. Don't wait for perfect weather. Go plant good seeds for your future to inherit. Go work on the life that five years from now, you can thank you and say, thank you for doing that. I needed to become this person and I couldn't have without you. Go give your future self a gift of growing in difficult seasons. Don't wait to feel safe. Don't wait to feel loved. You don't have to wait for that because God already loves you. You are already loved by the creator of your life and of the universe. He says, I will be with you. I will see you through this. You can experience unconditional, amazing love right now and forever. Don't miss the season of learning to grow and learning to trust God with the relationships in your life. You can trust his love, which will let you open up and not have to be so right that you can start making your relationships right and they can grow through difficulty. What's a good step that you could take in this process? Uh, you got to choose what God's leaning on your heart today. But I pray for you today that God will lead you to grow no matter what the season is that you're in. Our city church, our city family, our city world, I love you so much. And this home series, I hope, has impacted you. Change your homes, change your future homes, change your children, change your marriage, change how you're going to be when you get married, the way you'll raise kids. I hope you'll refer back to this message and be able to look into it as how you can build your home for now and for the future. I love you so much. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Bye. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris, for an amazing message. We are so blessed to have you as a lead pastor. And thank you all for tuning in with us today. Now remember to text DATEBOX to 949-755-7606 to get your resource for this week. Families, head on over to ourcity.church slash family content to download this week's family challenge and resources. And don't forget to head to ourcity.church slash birthday to claim your seat for the second birthday celebration before spots run out. Have a great week and let's change the world together.